I'm going to be talking about a Christmas episode this time around. But forgive me. It's also December when I'm recording this, so... And it's cold, so... Shut up. Hello everyone, and welcome back to Doctor Who's Crown Jewels. The series where I go through the best of the best. Season 3 is not necessarily the best, but I will discuss my favourite stories from that season as I don't want to leave any stone unturned. As I have literally just said, we are doing season 3 today, and... I... I've had a bit of a journey with season 3 recently. Previously, I thought it was alright, maybe on the level of, say, series 6. Uh, and I, I I think that series is underrated, as you may know from other videos on the channel. But now, I'm thinking I may have treated it a bit harshly. Season 3 was heavily affected by missing episode junkings, so my perception of these episodes may not have been as full as they otherwise would have been. But this time around I was really clicking with the reconstructions. Although they're not even going to be honourable mentions, the Mythmakers and the Savages have really gone up in my estimations. Not like a considerable amount, but a, no a, but a notable amount. It's not so much that I think they're the best of the season by any means, but they're like on par with say Galaxy 4 now. I haven't rewatched the arc, because I know I don't like the arc, and I don't think anything will make me like the arc. It's not good. It's not good. But there are stories in the season that I know are good. Let's start with the honourable mention. Mission to the Unknown. Why is this an honourable mention at all? Well, it's a separate story. People are like, oh, it's part of Dalek's master plan, but A, it's a very disconnected story. B, just because a story is set on the same planet with the same monsters doesn't necessarily mean it's part of the same story. I wouldn't say Attack of the Cybermen. It is like part five of Tomb of the Cybermen. And three, an entire story is aired in between. So if they aren't separate stories, why, why is it, I don't get, I don't get your maths there. But I do understand why people do consider it the same story. Uh, because it is a lot more connected than other stories usually are. So... For that reason, although I do think it would be a candidate for Crown Jewels, because of the murky waters, it's an honourable mention. We follow Mark Corey, and he is a space security service person posing as just some mechanic, and they crash-landed on Campbell. There's good suspense about what the Daleks may be doing here, but also good suspense and horror to do with the Vargas themselves. We don't really see much of the Varga plants in Daleks' master plan itself, so it is a good thing that we do see more of them here. And also seeing the alliance with the Daleks and all the other uh, creatures from the outer galaxies planning to take over the solar system. Foreshadowing right into the first crown jewel candidate of the video, Daleks Master Plan. It's a 12-parter. It's long, but it's worth it. Well, eight parts of it are worth it. You can you can skip parts seven through nine. No, actually, no, seven through ten, actually. Yeah, seven through ten. So, how are the Daleks planning to conquer the solar system? They've allied themselves with the guardian of the solar system, Mavic Chen, who's provided them with a rare element called Terranium. Terranium is the only thing that can power the Daleks' new mega weapon, the Time Destructor. And it's up to the Doctor, Steven, Katarina for a bit, Brett Vion for a bit, and Sarah Kingdom for a bit. There's a reason why I say for a bit. They all die. Yeah, this story's bleak. And the power of the Time Destructor, if you didn't get a sense of it in the first six parts, you do in the last two, especially when it activates. Because not only do we see Sarah crumble into dust, we also see when Steven goes out, too late, not even realizing Sarah's dead, when he's trying to help the Doctor, the Doctor screams at him in a visceral and raw way to get back in the TARDIS because it's not safe. Like, that was the rawest thing I've seen in Doctor Who. It's a shame that it is mostly missing. Um, 
Only three out of the 12 parts survive, and we're never going to get the full 12 because there's only one copy of the Christmas episode, part seven, the Feast of Stephen, and that copy was destroyed. Uh, so we're never getting that back, and I'm, I couldn't care less, it's not good. That's the only part of the story that I really don't like. Because even the filler aspect, yeah, they're a bit more lighthearted, which kind of disrupts with the tone, but doesn't mean it's bad. Like, they go to Egypt for a bit, the monk shows up. Dalek's master plan is very... It's, there's, there's nothing quite like it in Doctor Who. And it's because they played on bleak fears of the time. Because they were in the middle of the Cold War. Nuclear annihilation was imminent at any stage. So Doctor Who doing an allegory of that is quite bleak. But it's also tense, well-paced for the eight episodes that actually have plot. It's it's just it's just a powerful watch. Even if you're just watching the reconstructions that are available, either the loose cannon one or Josh Nez yet again did a reconstruction of the Dalek's master plan. Not not just part one this time, all of it. They did the whole thing. And that is something to be commended. I've honestly got not much more to say other than the Guardian of the Solar System, Mavic Chen, played by Kevin Stoney. What a powerful performance. Like, honestly, one of the best villain performances in the entire show. It's easy to see how the Daleks can ally with him because he stands out amongst the Daleks and manages to out-presence them. So, is it time for something more lighthearted? No, let's continue with the bleak theme. We've got the massacre, the immediate next story. Because, you know, after 12 weeks of bleak annihilation looming over the universe, quite literally the universe, as well as three of the Doctor and Steven's friends dying pretty brutally, they decided, do you know what would, what would make viewers calm down and cheer them up? More death with the massacre. <laughs> it's called the massacre because it actually takes place in the days leading up to the massacre of the day of Saint Bartholomew. The massacre itself was a direct result of Catholic Protestant tensions in Paris being very ooh, close to breaking point. To try and mediate the Catholic Protestant population the Protestant king decided to marry a Catholic. And although that may have been a temporary fix, that doesn't stop all of the uh, Catholic Church's attacks on Protestants. The Doctor's largely out of the picture for this one. He's in it at the very start and in it at the very end. It's because he went to try and find a scientist living in Paris at the time to discuss his ideas of germology. However, the Doctor didn't get back before the curfew, and then got lost, and Stephen ended up being embroiled in some Protestant, like, politics. And it doesn't help that the Doctor looks exactly like a prominent member of the Catholic Church. Things get a bit complicated for Stephen. What further complicates the Huguenots, the the Protestants, is that there is a woman called Anne Chaplet who's worried about the fact that there may be a massacre uh, about to happen because there was one where she used to live. This one is very much the best story to feature Stephen because it gives him the most to do. I mean, the docs is out of the picture and he's the only regular left, so it kind of has to have him be good to make the story good. And everyone being different levels of suspicious really makes the whole story feel very tense. And not only is it a defining serial for Steven, it also has a defining moment for the Doctor. Spoiler alert for like a 50 odd year old serial of Doctor Who that no longer exists in the BBC archive. The Doctor and Steven leave Paris in the 16th century and they did not take with them 
Anne Shapley, nor did they try to save her. The Doctor actually tried making it so that she remains in Paris during the massacre. The Doctor tries to comfort Stephen by saying, mm, Yes, she probably survived. Stephen knows the likelihood of her survival is pretty minimal. So he leaves out of anger because it seems like the Doctor's morality is still clouded by his scientific judgement, when in reality, no. The Doctor has a responsibility for time travel, we've known this, and this was meant to be sort of, I guess, damage control. But then, you see emotional heart in the Doctor. He seems to miss all of his friends who didn't really understand or really click with being a time traveller. And now he's been left all alone. And he even contemplates going back to his home planet. But he's in exile. So he can't do that. Perhaps I should go home. Back to my own planet. But I can't. It's so beautiful. It's so touching. It's my favourite moment of the first Doctor. Even correcting himself properly when getting Ian's name wrong. Honestly, I think the massacre, if it ever gets recovered, or gets an animation, it's a must-see. Which is why it's a crown jewel. Although one last thing to note on, there is a weak spot in the massacre. The thing is, I wouldn't say these stories are, like, perfect, because the weak point in Dark Master Plan, four episodes could be cut. The weak point in the massacre is, is the fact that it introduces easily the worst companion, the, or at least one of the worst companions the show has ever had to offer, Dodo Chaplet. She bursts in, needs to, like, f ring a policeman because some boy has, like, died or something, and she doesn't really care that the sh ship's bigger on the inside. Stephen runs in because there's police officers approaching the TARDIS, the Doctor takes off, and Dodo doesn't really care, in all honesty. Um, I think the scene itself is fine in terms of writing. I don't think it's a badly written scene. It's certainly a choice to have a companion introduction like this, but it's an even bigger and, I'd say, wrongly made choice to put it at the end of the massacre. These two stories are the best of season three, there's no doubt about it, and they, they are some of the best Hartnell stories as well. They're not as good as the choices I've made for season two, and nowhere near as good as the choices I made for season one. However, they're still very strong. But anyways, what did you think of this episode of Crown Jewels? What's your favourite season three story? Have you experienced any more than like four of them? But for those who have, do you agree with me? Or is The Savages actually the best? Or am I completely wrong about the arc? Leave your thoughts in the comments below and I'll see you next time where I talk about the Crown Jewels of season four. I'll see you next time.